we're going to pick up in Hebrews 11. We had talked about Abraham when we ended last time. And he's looking for a city that was to come in the future. And now in verse 11, we find out that by faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed. And she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore from one man, and him as good as dead, were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the sea so, seashore. Never can't say that word. <laughs> by faith, Sarah. Now Sarah's faith was not perfect. <laughs> we know that. <laughs> did, you, did your translation say she? Does it give credit to her? Uh, bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful. Okay, so it's mine says because he considered him faithful. Well, it says she and mine. Yeah. And then it says, therefore, from one man is good, and him is good as dead. Hmm. So. Hmm. Well, I, I'm reading NIV, but in the notes it does also have the she as in the notes. It does? So, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. yeah. A little interpretation going on there. I just thought they were giving Sarah better than the doubt. Uh huh. <laughs> Um, now we know that her faith is not perfect. What did Sarah do when she heard she was going to have a child in her old age? She laughed. She laughed. <laughs> so obviously she didn't have this. She was no superwoman of faith. Um, she had a little trouble even doubting that it was going to happen. Yet, um, because she judged him faithful, who had promised. If it wasn't her faith. She knew that God was faithful. It didn't rely upon her believing and relied upon what he said he was going to do. And that is an important lesson in faith. Um, for many years, the faith movement that took off and, and was flying around really was, if you had enough faith, you could do anything. And it became faith in faith. I had to work out my faith. Well, no, it's faith in God and what he said and what he's promised to do because he's the one who's faithful. <laughs> And we just have to get on the same page as him to make it all work. So, and this is the case here with Sarah. It wasn't her faith. It was the fact that the one that God was faithful, she knew it would happen. She couldn't believe it. But she knew if God said it, it would happen. Um, so it was this faith that enabled Sarah to receive strength and to conceive seed. Again, where does the strength come from that allowed her to do this? from God it's a, you know, that faith and God gave the strength to her to be able to go through this now how old was he? what do you remember? 90 90 years old that's rough to get pregnant at 90 <laughs> so <laughs> rough to get out of bed at 90 <laughs> and, so, and it's not so much the pregnancy as it is you have a baby after that <laughs> Uh, for a long, for quite a while. So, um, but God gave the strength and Sarah received it by faith. Um, and because of that, out of this one man comes as, comes as many, or were born as many as the stars of the sky and the sand on the seashore. So, again, we look always at the big grand picture. We want to see the big thing. God do the big thing. And yet all it required here was for Abraham and Sarah to have one child correctly. <laughs> and that's all it took to start innumerable descendants. And we'd never be able to be counted because there's so many of them. And both, we now know that through all of this, that through both physical descendants and the spiritual descendants of Abraham, that anyone who accepts God by faith <coughs> is the son of Abraham. You, you fall into that category. And so, um, so it's amazing what happens. Faith, their faith had an impact on more lives than they could have ever dreamed of. And that's the thing we don't know. When we walk this walk for the Lord and we come in contact with someone's life, you don't know the impact it's going to have forever on someone else and generations down the road if the Lord does not return. You know, it's... You can't count it. It's innumerable what God does if we'll just walk by faith. Then in verse 13, all these died in faith, 
not having received the promise, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed them that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Now, all these people that he's mentioned so far and going to mention by faith, um, all of them died without ever receiving the promises God gave them. Um, when Abraham died, how many kids did he have? <laughs> Two. One legitimate, one illegitimate. <laughs> and yet he died knowing that there were going to be innumerable children. <laughs> You know, he didn't see the promise fulfilled. Uh, the land was given to him. Did they <coughs> occupy the land? No. All he owned in that land when he died was a burial cave. <laughs> he owned his burial ground. <laughs> that was it. Because um, he knew it was his and he was going to stay there forever. But uh, as, as an earthly possession. Um, so they died not having received the promises that were given to them. Um, and yet they all believed it. And it comes back to this thing. Do we believe what God tells us? Do we believe what his word says about him? And it's one of those things that has always been a challenge to me. Because I've always said, well, of course I do. But then I stop and look at, do I really? <laughs> do I live by that? Do I believe that God is going to fulfill everything he says in his word? And there are days I have to say, I wonder. I don't know. I wonder if he really is. Most of the time I do. <laughs> Most of the time I don't have trouble with it. There is that occasional day where you just go, whenever, especially when everything's going wrong. This is really all worth it. <laughs> and uh, and you go, well, hold it. Of course it is. And then you slap yourself around and you stop thinking like that. that stinking thinking, as they call it. And get back to reality. But what are they assured? What, what is the driving force behind these people of faith here? in this little section that we just read. Their heavenly kingdom? They have given up the world. It's not about owning things here. It's not about having things here. It's not about property down here. It's about the heavenly kingdom that is coming. It is about the kingdom of God. They have been able to let go of what's down here. Now they still live in the world. Some of them, as we know, become very wealthy and possess a lot of things. Abraham being one of those. Because God blesses, blessed him and all that. There's nothing wrong with that. But his heart was not set on those things. His heart was set on the kingdom to come. On that eternal city that was going to be made without hands. That's the one he wanted. We as believers, if we want to make it through this world and this life, we've got to let go of this world can't be worried about winning here. We have to be worried about seeing the kingdom of God come. That our importance and what we work on is making sure the kingdom things are done while we're here. And that we lay groundwork for that kingdom to come, whether, you know, how, you know, again, believers have tons of ways of believing how it's going to happen. All we know is it's going to happen, and we just need to be prepared and ready, you know, to share it with everyone we come in contact with. Um, I think something that holds a lot of us back in this world is this world. Things we have in this world. We're afraid of stuff. We're afraid we're going to lose this. We're afraid we're not going to have our retirement. We're afraid we're not going to make it. You know, I've had people come to me and say, I can't go to Kenya because I'm afraid. You know, it's afraid of what? And they may not even know. Not even able to voice it. They're just afraid. Well, we've got to let go of this world. There's nothing to fear down here. Now, I don't mean you don't use your brain. God did give us one. We don't do stupid things. I mean, if I go jump off a roof, I'm probably going to hurt something when I land. It'll be great till that moment. But, uh, but that moment of landing, you know, there is physics. <clears throat> Unless God is telling me to jump off that roof, then I better not jump off the roof. Not anymore, anyway. Try to win So. Um, you know, they became strangers and pilgrims in this world. 
And you know what? That's what we need to be. Believers should not fit in. We have tried so hard to fit into this world, and we shouldn't fit into this world. We should be walking as though we're of the kingdom of God, we're ambassadors of Christ. We don't fit in this world, but we live in it. We have joy, peace. We have assurance that God is with us, and we are going to look weird to the world. They're going to have trouble understanding us. How can you be that way? Look at all that's going on, you know. What? It's not my world. It's not my problem. Have you heard about Jesus? <laughs> you know, let me tell you about him. He's who I'm here to work for, and that's who I work for. And I tell you. I'm a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. If I want to travel, I had to have a passport here, so I'm a U.S. citizen here because I had to have a passport. <laughs> but if I didn't need a passport, I don't need to have a citizenship down here anywhere. I can, I can be a person of no country. It would be all right with me. But at the same time, <clears throat> You know, by faith, we get through the difficult, discouraging times if we understand that this is not for us. This is not the end. This is just a passing through. And it is hard. It's hard to get to that point where you let go of everything here. Paul well, Winkler's always taught in his, his financial classes and so forth, you have to have the open hand policy. You have your hand open, God gives you blessings and whatever it is, but you never close your hand on them because if God wants them back, He can have them back. <laughs> if He needs them to use somewhere else, He takes them back and uses them. Our tendency is to close those fists and hang on to whatever we have because I can't lose it. I can't lose it. Well, what does the Scripture say about gaining and losing? <laughs> you want to gain your soul, what do you have to do? <laughs> you got to lose your life. You gotta let it go. You gotta let go of this world and quit being attached to it. Now I like some things out here, and I struggle to let go of them. But <laughs> that's. But my heart is to get to that point where I'm not attached to anything but the human beings down here. Nothing but them. Everything else can go. Like I'm ready to get rid of this building, but that's another that's a whole other story. <laughs> we just spent three hours tracing a phone line that wasn't working right. So. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a simple fix when we finally found it. It was just the finding of it that was the hard part. But you know, you just go and tell you like that, you go, I don't like this building. I don't like this place. I want to get rid of it. Can we sell it? <laughs> Let's meet in homes. Let somebody volunteer their homes. We've got four pastors on staff on a Sunday. You know how many people we could minister to? We do all did we all did three home churches on a Sunday. <laughs> Times four. We could hit everybody that's coming here. <laughs> so, and you fix your home, and I don't have to fix this building. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, that sounds really good to me right now. <laughs> Just breaks. And so, but, you know, those things are letting, you know, those are just things we'd like to let go of things. But um, at the same time, God's blessed us with a building, too. Um, all of these die in faith. When we die, when we die in faith, the term we usually don't think of that you die in faith. When we die, do we are still going to be believing we're going to heaven? <laughs> I love it when you see a saint go to be with the Lord when you're with them. Man, they they're like, don't hold me back. Let me go. It's time to go. <laughs> it's you know, they fight to keep their life, but they reach that point where all of a sudden I don't know if they're seeing over to the other side or what's going on, but suddenly it's like, oh, don't hold on to me any longer. I gotta go. <laughs> far better where I'm going than where I'm at. <laughs> so, and, uh, and the faith is never to escape death, but it's to die in faith. It's to go through that process understanding that there's so much more beyond, so much better, so many more things out there. Um, it wasn't about just simple dependence on God either. It's about entering into who He is and what He is. And entering into his kingdom in its fullness. And again, I, I've dwelt on this so much, I don't know why recently, that how far beyond our comprehension this next world is going to be. Uh, it is going to be unbelievable. And I think if we all had a glimpse of it, it would change how we approach everything down here. <laughs> Just recently, again, when people ask me about their animals, will I see my animal in heaven? Well, I doubt it. 
But I think you're going to see animals in heaven that you cannot believe. You're going to see what a real dog looks like. <laughs> a real horse looks like. we got copies down here. These are just shadows. These are... <laughs> and as wonderful as they are, they're nothing like what we're going to see in heaven. And phenomenal. We'll, put, we'll see animals we don't even have down here, <laughs> probably. Because <laughs> God has created everything. And his, his imagination is so far beyond Look for that greater place, that greater country. Um, you know, our world really pushes naturalism, what we see. It's so funny because they push that what you see, what you have here, that's what's reality. And yet they use evolution to explain how it came into existence, which is not reality, <laughs> which is just an idea. It's just with no scientific basis to it. And uh, yet, this is not the reality. This is just the temporary creation. And uh, one day, that table's not going to be there. This building will not. I guess what? This whole earth isn't going to be here one day. It's going to be a new heaven, a new earth. And that's where our minds have to be set if we're going to make it through this world. <laughs> when it gets rough, think about what's coming. Don't look at the problem. Well, if you have to solve something, you got to look at it. But I mean, understand me that it's get your eyes on what's to come. It's so much better. And uh, then you can go through the mo light momentary afflictions that we go through here for the surpassing greatness and glory that we will have in the future. We also, we, many times we consider that the idea that we should not be ashamed of God. You know, it's one of those things we should be bold about who he is and what he is and be ashamed of who he is. And, but we got to make sure God's never ashamed of us. And when we get tied up into the affairs of this world, I really wonder if he just sometimes goes, you're missing it, you're missing the point. Now, he's called some people to be involved in government. He's called some people to be involved in those things. But they don't keep their eyes and their focus on Christ, not on the things of this earth. Because when you get wrapped into the things of this world, what happens? <laughs> you will get distracted from the things of God. And there's no way you can't. It just will happen. Now, God, if he's called you to do something, will also give you the ability and the faith to stay straight <laughs> in what you're called to do, too. So that's why I don't say... People say, well, not, if we not be involved in government? No, if God calls you to be involved in government, you better be involved in government. That's what God's calling you to do, but just remember, keep your eyes on Christ while you're in that government. Don't ever expect the government to solve issues. Christ solves them. And uh, the problem is, all those ones that I've seen so far that have been that way usually leave government quite quickly <laughs> afterwards and they realize, we can't fix this. This is an earthly, this is a worldly system. We got to get back to. That. I want to go home and just serve my neighbors. I want to go home and do the work of Christ. Or it changes them. It changes them and brings compromise into their. Or life. else you get caught in it because the world is going to demand compromise. Yeah. yeah, I'll give you that if you give me this. <laughs> and you know, so let's just make sure that when we make sure that you never lose sight of the reality of God in heaven. The unseen realm. That it is more real than this. Because if that's the case, man, the stuff in Scripture when you read it now all makes sense. You know, man, I can believe that. How did Jesus do miracles? Well, the power of the kingdom of God entered this world of time and space. That's all it was. It wasn't a miracle for him. It was him just doing what he does. <laughs> From our perspective, it's a miracle. It's because we don't know how he did it. A miracle is something happens you don't know how it happened. That's all a miracle is. And uh, but we know how it happens. The infinite touches that which is finite, and something happens. Something changes. Somebody gets healed. Bed raised to life. Even his death on the cross. What did it do? People were coming out of the graves. <laughs> you know, they, think about that kind of power just released in general. When he said it is finished, the world starts breaking up with earthquakes. <laughs> you know, a wonder of creation started to think, I guess this is it. We fall apart now without him. But it was only momentary. 
uh, that, that that happened. You know, even he gives us some hints on how, for our weakness of faith, how things can be possible. For mm -hmm. example, like learning about quantum mechanics mm -hmm. and about this Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. You keep figuring out where an electron is. Mm -hmm. it, the time you looked at it, you've moved it wherever yeah. it is. And that's been a problem for the natural world because they want everything really cut and dried, mechanistic, and here you can't decide where it's oriented, mm -hmm. which changes everything that the atoms and molecules make up. So when I learned that, I, I realized that when God would take a man who had a withered hand and make it whole, mm -hmm. if he has the authority over those electrons, there is provision already in the natural laws for sure. him to have those electrons somewhere else, and it breaks none of the laws of science, mm -hmm. and it, it can make a withered hand whole or make somebody be somewhere else, or anything else like that. Sure. And so, I mean, we already have some hints as you learn more of his nature. If someone has the right authority and the right ability, like you created it, mm -hmm. to be able to do these kind of things, and, you know, our, our, our faith is not such a stretch yeah. in these kind of things. It is a reasonable faith when you, when you recognize these things. Mm -hmm. Verse 17, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promise offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called. Concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. We all know the story of Abraham and Isaac, you know. This is the promised son comes along, and then suddenly God says, I want you to sacrifice him to me. Now, <laughs> Right there alone, you got to stop and, and ponder that question. If God were to come down to you and say, I want you to sacrifice your child to me, what would be your response? Now, at this point, it depends which child. <laughs> I, see, I see you back there, Cheryl. <laughs> which day of the week it is. <laughs> it moves from child to child. That's the life goes on. So. But seriously, what kind of God would ask you to kill your child? And what kind of faith does it take for Abraham to say, okay? Knowing that you promised it through this child, so if I kill him, that means you're going to raise him from the dead. Mm -hmm. That is faith. Mm -hmm. And in the figurative sense, as it says, that's what he did, because he was ready to sacrifice him. He had raised the knife. Mm -hmm. And you know, God says, stop, 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 there's a ram. Use, that, use him instead. Because he showed him he wasn't going to spare his son. If God wanted him, God got him. <laughs> and it just shows you the heart of Abraham, how close it is to that father's heart, that God didn't spare his own son. <laughs> he let him go all the way through to death. <laughs> Nobody delivered him at the last second. <laughs> because he completed the process that needed to be completed. So it's fascinating, you know, to think, would you have said yes to the Lord? <laughs> would what you even know of God now if he came down and asked you of that? Of course, it wouldn't make sense now, but even if he did, would you say yes to him? Or would you have a little discussion about this? <laughs> well, we need to talk about this. I don't think we can do this. And I was always amazed in that story Isaac went along with it. Because they get out there, he's carrying his own firewood <laughs> for his, to burn himself up with. He gets out there and asks, where's the sacrifice? And what does Abraham say? God will provide. And then he binds him up and lays him on <laughs> the altar. I think Isaac probably figured out at that point <laughs> that he was the sacrifice. But did nothing, apparently, to resist it. By faith. We talk about faith. <laughs> and then God delivered them. Well, you have multi-generational trust here. Mm -hmm. Authority and trust. Abraham submitted to the authority of God and the trust he had in, and Isaac did the same with his father. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, to me, my first instinct would be, God, is this really you? Mm -hmm. But the fact is, Abraham had such an awareness of who God was mm -hmm. that he had no doubt that it was God. And so, because he had no doubt it was God, because of all of the incidents he had with him, you find that sometimes faith runs into what the limits of our doctrine are. 
because the doctrine at that time would have said that this God, who they didn't know much about really back mm -hmm. then, but even then this doesn't sound characteristic of God compared to the Canaanite gods right. at the time. But he proceeded with it anyway, the same way with Job. Mm -hmm. The doctrine that was prevalent in his era was that God would not punish people unless they'd done some great sin. Right. But Job, while he struggled and faltered, ultimately he had some measure of faith mm -hmm. that God knew what he was doing. But it showed, it showed the limitations of their doctrine because of their faith. Yeah. yeah. You know, it says that this term in here, accounting that God was able, um, that God was able to do this, was a, is actually an accounting term in the Greek, uh, which means exactly what it would be in English, an arithmetic expression, a decisive and carefully reasoned act. Abraham thought this thing through and decided, yep, it's the right thing to do. <laughs> now that amazes me, because if I don't like it long enough, I can talk myself out of anything. <laughs> and Abraham thought it through and reasoned it was right, because God is able to raise him from the dead. Therefore, it's the right thing if he asked me to put him to death, to put him to death. And when Isaac wasn't a young boy, wasn't he like a man at that time? So he could have overpowered uh, if he, he wanted to. 13, 14. Was he? Oh, yeah, he was, he was a teenager. So. But if Abraham was old then. Right. Abraham, Abraham was old then. So you know what? And some of these old guys in the Old Testament didn't lose much of their strength or <laughs> figure out <laughs> until and he did live to 120 so <laughs> well, like been, Mike was saying he was he was raised to believe in God and he knew the father's voice like his dad otherwise I'm sure he would have been running to the hill <laughs> so, <I> mean, <laughs> up till now nobody had been raised from the dead either right? no and nobody had been raised from the dead at this point that we know of that's recorded huh. anyway so he's going on total faith in this God, this unseen God, who has no image, and who has, who comes down and one day tells him, hey, you need to move. And Abraham packs up and moves. <laughs> you really wonder how that relationship looked and how it worked. We don't know. And you can ask Abraham one day if you really want. Uh, but you know, it's just amazing that you know, we have, like you said, we can look around us and see the proofs of God. I mean, they're all over the place. Creation declares its glory, it says. But, you know, everything's there. If you need it, it's there. God can show you who he is through nature. He can show you through people. He can show you through his own power. He can show you all these things. And uh, we've got all the, then we have Jesus. We have the Holy Spirit. We have all that. But here's Abraham just walking by faith. He had seen a lot of things though with Sarah having the baby at 90 and all these right. other things that so yeah, he, but, that helps. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he had this conversation with the angels that came through town. Mm -hmm. But you still stop and think about that. I know a lot of people have had miraculous things happen in their life and you know six weeks later they're complaining to God about things. <laughs> you know, because he's not doing it again the way they want him to do it. <laughs> Abraham didn't seem to have that problem. Now, Abraham made some big mistakes. He's not perfect. Not a perfect man. Yeah, he'd fumble the ball a little stuff. Like he would do yeah. this, but then he's afraid of Abimelech and pretends yeah. it's our player out to his and wife. He'd get, get he's afraid, afraid of his sister. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, and he knew who his God was. I, you know, I just want to reiterate, too, though, that it, faith like this does expose the frontiers of our doctrine. Mm -hmm. When God pushes us out of a box that we put him in, and I think a good corollary to the story with Abraham is the one with Peter when he's praying on the roof. Mm -hmm. And God says, these animals, unclean animals, kill and eat them. Yeah. Now, he would have had to recognize the voice of God as well. Even though he said, these are supposed to be unclean animals. My whole faith, my whole life told me not to eat these animals. This was the commands of God, don't eat them. Mm -hmm. But evidently, he had enough faith to recognize this is God. And God said, things have changed. Or... At least I'm, I'm teaching you this in, in terms of a bigger lesson on what's going on. Mm -hmm. So that expanded his mind of his doctrine of what God could do. Yeah. There were people who were rich. I mean, what, what did Hosea think when he was told to marry a prostitute? 
You know, uh, these other kind of things. God, God will, God forbids these kind of things. And I think sometimes God will call us to minister to people who we have been cultivated to believe are untouchable mm -hmm. in our evangelical culture. We shouldn't be around. We shouldn't immerse ourselves with these people or, or be around them. He might want you to hang around. Them. Yep. You know. At some point, I, I I think it's true of anybody who really walks with the Lord. At some point, He's going to take your faith and shake it to get you out of your comfort zone. Yeah. To get you out of your traditions of the church, and to get you. You know, I think it's sometimes easier for someone who never had it, never raised in church, never had to come in and figure it out, than for those of us raised in the church who was raised in a church culture. Which a lot of it's good, <laughs> not all biblical, but still a lot of it's still good, even though it's not a biblical requirement. But then God says, "I want you to go do this here," and you go do it. And of course, you know my story. But moving to Europe changed how I viewed everything in the church because they did things all different there. They didn't do it right, <laughs> but they were loving God, and people were getting saved there, and they had their own thing going. It was the same Holy Spirit, the same God, the same Jesus. <laughs> And yet, they did it in their culture, in their cultural way. And I was like, whoa. We've got to stop looking at, you know, again, the things down here. And if you know Jesus, and you know the Holy Spirit, and you know what He does, and you recognize Him for what He is, how it plays out in a culture is not your problem. <laughs> and something you can't control. But I recognize God as a I recognize God is doing it, so I just get out of the way or get in the flow or whatever expression you want to use and uh, let him do his thing. Uh, if it wasn't for people like that, you wouldn't have the David Wilkerson's who, you know, country preacher runs in New York City and say, into a court case <laughs> to say, I want to help these young people, these teenagers and these gangs and on drugs and everything. I'm here to help them. How are you going to do that? I don't know. <laughs> God sent me. <laughs> so that's the way Teen Challenge started. God just sent him. And he just went and did it. And he didn't. He had no clue what he was doing. But he was following the Holy Spirit, the leading of the Holy Spirit. And he broke out of every tradition <laughs> of the church. And then, uh, you know, Times Square Church in New York, the church he founded. <laughs> and, you know, he's done. he did amazing things during his life. And he's now with the Lord. You know, probably looking back saying, boy, I could have done so much more. <laughs> you know? But it was good. It was good. Someone else pick it up. You know? <laughs> Carry on. Not necessarily Teen Challenge, but a ministry of any type that God called you to. And uh, it doesn't have to, you know, Pastor Jerry has talked about this. We don't do a lot of formal outreaches from this church because we want all of you outreaching all the time. Just get out there. Do whatever. You know, when you start to find out, we have people who volunteer, you know, Cumberland Crisis. We got people who volunteer at other places and they go do this. We have people at the mission working and doing things. We got you know, people out doing other things. Let them do it. We don't need to organize everything here. What do we know? We don't know any of that. We'll let the Holy Spirit orchestrate a lot of that and see what happens. And we end up reaching a lot more people probably than an organized. You know, it's okay to do an organized. That's why I take trips overseas. To, you know, those who have a heart for that, to get a chance to see what goes on overseas and get an experience of another culture and get you way out of your comfort zone. <laughs> Put you in place where you have no idea what you're doing or how to do it, but God somehow uses you. And hopefully increases your faith when you come back to know that I can do that anywhere. And I'm not bound by anything. I'm not bound by time and space anymore. I'm just bound by my own getting in the way. <laughs> that's the only thing that stops me from doing anything is I get in my own way. If I'll stay out of my way, God will do great things. And, but, you know, we keep learning. Uh, when Abraham was confronted with a promise and a command from God which seemed to contradict each other, I'm giving you a son, I'm taking your son away. <laughs> well, the first promise was your descendants will be as, you know, stars of the sky and sand on the seashore, you got to have that son for that one to be fulfilled. And yet God's second command contradicts it. and says, I'm going to kill him. I want you to kill him. I'm going to take him back. Um, he did, when he was faced with that, what we all should do. He obeyed the command. 
and you let God take care of the promise. We have nothing to do with the promise. God gave it to us, but we don't control that. That's his promise to us. So if he gives us a command, we do the command. And he'll take care of how the promise works out. In his case, like he said, he believed he'll raise him from the dead. Because he's going to fulfill his promise. Abraham knew that. So he'll raise him from the dead. Then. And uh, instead he stopped him right before he killed him. Which tells you that he fully intended to go through with it. There was no intent on stopping there. He was going to go through with this whole thing. Uh, he wasn't just putting out an act for God. God is able to take care of the promise. You just do what you're told to do by God. And again, God will usually not act outside of his character. Um, now this seems outside his character though. And again, if you know God's voice and you know that's God, act on it. And let God take care of it. Um, you, you know one, one area, the controversial area, that I find a challenge in, in practicing what you just taught. It, it's having a real love of Bible prophecy and having been a dispensational person. Mm -hmm. when, when I finally recognized that God's command was for me to preach the gospel and the good news mm -hmm. of, the, of the kingdom to all people, including the people of Israel, rather than to help God bring about his promise to what he's going to do in the last days. Mm -hmm and focus on political cover for the people of Israel or to build their temple for them mm -hmm. for their antichrist or to do all these other kind of things that were well-meaning mm -hmm. that I wanted to do and other Christians wanted to do to help but were not a was not the command that God gave me throughout the New Testament to preach the gospel to them like the apostles did mm -hmm. in the book of Acts mm -hmm. and I, I wanted to help God with his promise I wanted to help them by making sure nobody criticized them. If they did anything and somebody mm -hmm. said it was wrong, to make sure that they avoided any repercussions. But I recognized all I was doing was like the, the guys on the boat in Joppa, helping the Jewish leader get away from what God had called him to do. Mm -hmm. I was facilitating the disobedience rather than helping bring it about. Yeah. I think it's really important, this whole thing on... We've got to leave the promises in God's hands. It's, it's, it's one of those subtle things you can get caught into. God's promised this, so it, I've got to be involved in its happening. Yeah. No, I don't. God is going to have it happen whether I'm involved or not. <laughs> you know, I don't oppose it. I'm not going to do anything that blocks it or that. But again, he's clear on his instruction to his disciples. What is the commission we were given? We were only given one commissioning <laughs> by God. So it's not too difficult for us. Mm -hmm. Go into all the world, make disciples. make disciples. Now what we've ended up doing a lot of times in the church is we've gone into all the world and tried to get people saved. That's not the calling. It's to make disciples. A lot harder. <laughs> you, get saved, you get people saved. You can get them an emotional thing at, you know, at the altar. You can do that. But can you get them to be disciples? Can you get them to follow the Lord every day? Can you get them to get into the Word? Can you get them to sacrifice their lives for the kite for the kingdom? <laughs> that's a lot. Of, that's a lot more work. It's not just a one day or one time thing. It's a lifetime of training and teaching and letting your life be an example to others of how this works and how this happens and and you do that by showing them well god said to love your neighbor love him and love your neighbor so you show them what love looks like well you're not kind and you're not patient and you're not you know all the things that love is then you're not loving and you're being a bad example you know, nothing bugs me more than see a Christian be rude to a waiter or a waitress. You can be kind even if they're messing up. <laughs> you can be nice about it. <laughs> you can say, yeah, uh, you really, uh, I think this isn't done right. <laughs> Is there any way we can get it fixed? Instead of, you idiot. <laughs> You're the most incompetent server I've ever had. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Oh, well, that was really kind. <laughs> that really showed love to somebody. 
who you don't know what kind of day that person's been having. Yeah, I I mean, some people are just screw ups too. I, I mean, I, 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 know that, I felt guilty doing it at the stakeouts here. Yeah, I know I shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have done that to us. We worked hard that day, Mike. I was having a bad day too. <laughs> but I got over it. Yeah. Months later. <laughs> you know, it's just we have to live it. We got to show it. You you make disciples by showing them how to live, not just by teaching. It's showing them how to do it. You live it. That's why Paul could say, follow me as I follow Christ. Now, he wasn't trying to put himself in the place of Christ. His hope was, you follow me till you figure it out, and then just go after Christ. Leave me and go, by, go beyond me. Get, do better than me. That's really what he was saying. Eventually, you're going to do better. But right now, while you're young and don't know it, follow me. I'll show you what I do. I'll show you how I love. And I'm, I'm not one to follow my love stuff. I'm still working on that. <laughs> Jerry, on the other hand, there's a man of mercy and of grace beyond grace. Uh, that guy can forgive anybody. You know, he has his struggles with some. <laughs> he can forgive anybody. You know, me, I don't forgive so easy. That's why he put us together. So, there's time to tell Jerry, we got to do something about this. <laughs> I think you've been grace graceful enough, merciful enough. It's time to say no. <laughs> they got to grow up eventually, <laughs> and um, and then he's taught me a lot about how to be graceful and how to uh, judge and be so quick to get to that. Sometimes we just want to fix it and get people kicked out or <laughs> put in their place. Or you don't see Jesus doing that. When he does it, he does it in such a gentle, loving way. You hardly even know you got put in your place. <laughs> Later on, you figure, wow, he just really got me, didn't he? <laughs> I missed it. What was going on? Um, in verse 20, he goes on to say, By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob. Wow. Um, now, Isaac, we know the story here. we got to look at it a little bit. He was really in the flesh, not in faith, when this whole story begins. Because who did he intend to bless? Esau. He wanted to give the blessing to Esau. He fully intended to give it to Esau. It was God who forced him into giving it to, to Jacob. Um, he wanted to give the birthright to Esau. It was all for carnal reasons. Why did he like Esau better than Jacob? He was a hunter, and uh, Isaac was partial to wild game. <laughs> they had stomachs that were just alike. And you know, and then what was Jacob like? Mama's boy. He was mama's boy, young around the tent. I bet you that there was more than once Isaac thought, where did I go wrong with Jacob? And the guy's a sissy. You know? I bet you that. I don't know. That's what he was thinking. <laughs> I'm a man. I know. <laughs> and, uh, and yet, Jacob was the one that was in the plan. <laughs> he was totally missing God's plan in this. And by faith, once the blessing was given to the correct one, what did he have to say? Esau demanded he get his blessing now. I've already given it to you. It's already done. I'm sorry. Nothing for me? No. I gave it all to your brother. Once it was done, he by faith went with it. He knew God now was in charge. That God pulled this off. He never blamed his wife, who was the one who was behind the deception. He never blamed her. He knew God did this. God switched those two on me. <laughs> God's the one who deceived me. <laughs> Even though Jacob is the deceiver. Yeah, as he said, it trembled, right? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> he realized, oops. He realized, I think what he was trembling more about was he realized how wrong he was. Right. He had missed God on this one, and then God fixed it anyway. Yeah. And again, this is somewhat of an encouragement to me. You can totally miss God on something, and he can still make it work right. <clears throat> because he's still going to accomplish his will. You can't trip God up. You can't make God fail because you didn't do something right. I, I had the period of my life where I went through some pretty severe depression and a lot of it was I thought I'd let God down. I 
wasn't doing things as well as I thought I should, and I thought I'd let God down. And I had a counselor that I went to for a while, and he was really good saying, you know, what, what's been going on? Why are you this way? I said, well, you know, I've really let God down. We're going to be missionaries overseas. It's all falling apart. I couldn't raise money. Da 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 da. Went through all this stuff, and he says, how do you know this isn't God's will to change what you're supposed to be doing? I never thought that. I just thought I had failed. And I stopped and went, hmm, oh, I don't know. Well, you know, you, you've, you've assumed something. <clears throat> you've assumed because you failed, it's your fault. And how do you know God didn't want you to fail? Hmm. <laughs> you start sitting there and just start thinking and going, huh, I guess I don't. I never bothered asking. I just assumed. God told me we we're going to do this, and I thought that's what he told me. And I'm still sure I heard right, and yet nothing worked right. It must be my fault. And that's when I had to come to the realization, you know, God is going to accomplish his will with or without me. He's going to accomplish his will for me as long as I claim to be his child. <laughs> He's going to put me where he wants me. And even if I miss him, He's still going to do the right thing. And lo and behold, of all places we ended up, was Nashville. The last place in the world I wanted to come. <laughs> no, it wasn't specifically Nashville. It was the South. <laughs> so you're saying that if you had done right before, we could have had somebody else? You could have had somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> I had only not failed earlier. I would be in Croatia today, loving life, instead of putting up with There's no television that I have. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Will do. Pastor Bill, you know, this, this reminds me uh, of almost like a, a test of our faith or a, a growth curve when it comes to uh, when things happen that don't make sense to us. Mm -hmm. It always reminds me of the words of the priest Eli and David in some words when he mm -hmm. said, what is the Lord, let him do as he sees fit. Mm -hmm. Like when you can get to that spot when things yeah. don't add up and you just say, he's the Lord, let him do as he sees fit. Yeah. Because he's got the long term, you know, but it's, you know, it's tough. It's tough. It's the big challenge of that is this, you're not letting go of your own life. And I think that's the struggle we hit. I know that was mine because I was saying, I failed, me, me, me. And God is saying, would you let go of you? <laughs> that was the ultimate thing he wanted me to do was let go of yourself. You're not that important. <laughs> I mean, in a good sense. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't make God fail. You can't ruin his plan. You can't stop his coming back. You can't prevent Israel from being reestablished one day. <laughs> Nor can you make any of it happen. <laughs> you're not, you're part, you're dust. You're a piece of dirt. <laughs> Whom God has empowered by His Holy Spirit to do phenomenal things. Just be obedient. Mm -hmm. Just do, don't worry about results. Yeah. That's not our concern. Results are not our concern. Nowhere are we told to bring in the results. Bringing in the sheaves is not a biblical concept. <laughs> it's a great song in its day, but it's not a biblical concept. We go out and make disciples. We don't bring anything in. We go out and plant. We go out and cultivate. The harvest, you start all over. You then take that person out and show them how to plant, <laughs> show them how to cultivate, and you move on to the next generation. It's, it's an ongoing process. It never ends. We don't know whose lives we've impacted. We don't know the truth. I, I can't wait to see some of these evangelists, evangelists get to heaven who had millions come to the Lord when they can only find about four or five when they get there that actually really came to the Lord. I mean, the rest were emotional. It was good. I remember the last Billy Graham crusade that I worked at. It was funny because, you know, everybody there just about was a Christian. And you still had thousands go forward. Just to say they did, just wanted to say they did it at a Billy Graham crusade. <laughs> what is the point of this? That's a lot of money being wasted. <laughs> now I think in his day he had some phenomenal things going on in his ministry. But by the end, especially when everybody knew he was last tour he was going on, every Christian wanted to go see him. He's an evangelist. Take the unsaved. Don't take Christians to go see him. Take the unsaved. <laughs> if anybody, you know. But we got it all backwards, you know. We like personalities. We like just want to say, "I saw the great Billy Graham," you know. And I actually had someone I know that came to the Lord from Billy Graham crusade, and uh, it's good. 
It's good. You know, we let God do what God's going to do, how he's going to do it. But we've got to get out of the business of the results. In this case with Isaac, he had it all backwards. But God did the right thing anyway. The right people were blessed. The right person got the blessing. Uh, when you really stop to think, Isaac was trying to block God's plan. Not intentionally. It was totally unintentional. That's why he trembled when he realized, I was in God's way. I really was. I couldn't, and then I realized, I can't stop God from doing what God's going to do. <laughs> and if I'm in his way, you know what? He's going to move me out of the way, <laughs> one way or another. And I'd rather voluntarily, I think he was scared to death God was going to just strike him dead for this thing. <laughs> and of course, God's grace said, nah. I tell you, a lot of things that people had going for them back in those days was that if you were one of Abraham's kinfolk, mm -hmm. he cut you a lot of slack because that's just the way God treats his friends. Mm -hmm. Because of Abraham, he cut a lot of slack, including Jacob, because they were related to Abraham. And I think the same thing with David, too. Some of the relatives of David, God mm -hmm. came slack to because he had really, really tight relationship with just a few people. And, and that's the way he showed his generosity to his friends, was that he cut extra slack to those folks. Yep. That's why it's good to have the faith of Abraham. It is. There's some friend benefits to it. Yeah, you want Abraham on your side. <laughs> you want the friend of God on your side. <laughs> yeah. That's an inside yeah. track. Um, let's go on to 21. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. And Jacob coming to the end of his life. Remember, he sat up in bed and blessed all the children. Prophesied over all of them about their future. All twelve. Um, now, if you look at Jacob's life, it was not a real spiritual life. <laughs> it was a very carnal, fleshly, you know, lived out life. He was a deceiver. He did a lot of deceiving in his lifetime. Of course, got caught by the great deception. <laughs> himself having to marry Leah instead of Rachel first <laughs> and uh, and that's just it if you're going to be a deceiver you're going to get to deceived in life it's you live by the sword you'll die by the sword Jesus said so <laughs> choose how you want to die because <laughs> the way you live is the way you'll die um, but here in this case it gets to the end of his life and he could look beyond his death and see the future. And again, that's really what they're talking about here. All these men and women saw something beyond themselves. They were able to see beyond this short-term life that we have here. But this is a bigger, I'm just a small piece in a very big story. <laughs> and if I can see beyond here, I can do well. He leaned on his staff and was able to prophesy over every child knowing there was a huge future down the road. And when you look back at the tribes, they fit in so well with Jacob's prophecies over them. You knew they were from the Lord. He was really saying, this is what this tribe's going to be like, and this tribe's going to be like this, and this tribe is going to be like this. And they fell right into it, you know, because it was from the Lord. But he was seeing beyond his death, beyond where he was going to be around, and what was going to happen in the future. And he worshipped because he was able to see that I can worship the Lord with what's going to come. Because I know the future's good. We, above all, as believers in Jesus, as we walk this life, we have the end of the story given to us through the revelation to John. <laughs> we know how it all turns out. We should be worshipping people. We should be worshipping God constantly. It should be a lifestyle of us just to worship the Lord. Because we know the end of the story. We've been told how we are victorious. We've been told how the king is coming back. We've been told how everything's going to play out. It's not left to chance anymore. There's no chance left. It's been spelled out by God. Now, we don't know the details of it all. and We're going to argue forever over the end times, which aren't even the end times. That's the part that bugs me the most is that most of Revelation is not about the end times. It's about the period before the last thousand years. <laughs> so there's at least another thousand years to come. So we're nowhere near the end. And uh, don't, 
doesn't finish yet. It keeps going. Now, there's going to be some major changes in the next thousand years. Like we're going to be ruling and reigning with Christ, which I, that blows my mind too. But whatever. <laughs> it's up to God. We'll just go along for the ride, enjoy it while we're there, do what He asks us to do. But worship. Demonstrate your faith and your dependence on God. It's okay to be dependent on God. Let's get rid of the American independent mindset, individualism. We are to be dependent on God. And we're to be interdependent with each other. We need each other. When you're having a bad day, I need to be there to lift you up. And when I'm having a bad day, you need to be there to lift me up. We need to work together. You know, we're our brother's keeper, you're saying. Yes, we are. We're, we're one body. If I, you know, if you drop something on your little toe, how does the rest of your body respond? Everything hurts. <laughs> Everything hurts. <laughs> and then you hit the smallest part of your body, and you just you're screaming in pain. Yes, yeah, so particularly the tongue. Yeah. <laughs> we should cut the tongue out. <laughs> when I read scripture, the tongue ought to just be removed. But uh, <laughs> we have a lot of trouble with it. <clears throat> but then you couldn't talk about the goodness of God <laughs> and the glory of His presence. <clears throat> if we didn't have the time, we couldn't sing praises to his name. Whether we sing well or not is irrelevant. It's all a sweet sound in his ear. Just bridle it. Just bridle Just keep it under control. And if it's not going to glorify God, keep it shut. <laughs> Don't say anything. I learned to do that for a long time. I had to just keep my mouth shut. Everybody go around giving their opinion on stuff and I just sit there. You have an opinion? Yeah, I'm not. <laughs> Yeah, I did. I just couldn't say it because it would have come out wrong. <laughs> so it's better to say nothing than to stick my foot in my mouth again. <laughs> and, uh, and I still occasionally get gets away from it. You're not looking. It'll get away from you. <laughs> so uh, be dependent upon God. Be interdependent with one another. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of his, the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. There's more coming. Joseph knows there's a future. I'm going to die here, but when you leave, don't forget to take my bones and bury me up in the land of Canaan. I'm not going to be buried in Egypt. That's not my land. <laughs> so he's still claiming the land that was given to Abraham, and they still didn't have possession of it. In fact, it's 450 years later when they carry him up. But he got carried up and buried in the land of Canaan because that was his... He saw the future. He believed what God had told Abraham. We're going back to the land. Maybe a long time, but it doesn't matter when. We're going. And it's the same on the return of Christ today. You know, you get tired of waiting. He's coming. He's going to come. How long is it? I don't know. <clears throat> Hope it's soon. I'm going to look for it tonight. <laughs> get up in the morning and look for it. <laughs> But until he comes, we stay busy, working for the kingdom, getting things done. Because, but he's coming. Never doubt it. <laughs> he's promised it. He didn't leave and say, well, I may be back if you're, uh, if you're nice to me. You know? <laughs> he said, I will come back the same way I'm looking me. He'll say, he'll be back just like he left. Clouds are going to part. And he's going to show up. So, look it. Put it away. It's there. That's the best bet you can take. Is he coming back? Yep. <laughs> if you're a betting person, bet on it. Good to win. <laughs> so, we just don't win. Uh, it was all it was supposed to be 84. <laughs> well, the blood moves. 88, and then the blood moves. That was supposed to be last year. Or maybe. <laughs> you know what? As soon as someone gives me a date and time, I know when he's not coming. <laughs> so that's what I want to know. At that point, oh, no, I cleared that day. I cleared that day off the calendar. Ain't coming in. So nobody can know. So we'll just move by to the next. It's like waiting to win the lottery. And so you know, by faith, Joseph. Joseph's faith testified for years after his death. All during that time, when the child of Israel saw Joseph's coffin. And they asked why it was there and not buried. Why didn't they give him a tomb in Egypt? And they could always answer because Joseph does not want to be buried in Egypt. 
He wants to go to the promised land that God gave us. But when are we going? Don't know, but we're going. One day we'll be there, and Joseph is going to be buried there. Till then, he's just going to sit in the coffin <laughs> on the ground, waiting for his burial. And he waited a long, long time, 400 years he waited. <laughs> but he got buried in the land. And because <laughs> God fulfills his word, fulfills the promises, and this promise was one to be fulfilled. Have you seen God fulfill any promises in your life? Mm -hmm. Is there any reason to doubt he'll not fulfill the ones that haven't happened yet? I mean, maybe he doesn't do it the way we want him to do it, the time we want him to do it, and in the place we want him to do it. But he's going to be faithful. Scriptures say he will be faithful because he cannot deny himself. If he says something, it has to happen. <laughs> it cannot not happen because he's faithful. So whatever he has promised will happen. You can take that all the way to the grave. No, you take that all the way like these people did to be on the grave. I look to the future. I look beyond my lifetime. I look to just another thousand years before he comes back. I don't know. Still he'll be faithful. <laughs> he still will fulfill that promise. He'll fulfill the promise in our lives. He's given us promises about our families. You know what? Sometimes those are the hardest to hold on to. You know, he desires our households are all saved. And he is such a gracious, good God. You can't, I cannot believe that I can do whatever it takes right up to the moment of death. Maybe even a minute past. I don't know. <laughs> to fulfill reaching every member of our families. I truly believe that Jesus himself may have to show up while they're about to die. He said, knock it off. I'm here. Accept me. Let's get, this, let's get to heaven. But he'll do it out of faithfulness. Because I prayed for them? No, probably because my mom prayed for them. <laughs> Who's already with the Lord, still praying for them. I know, she's still praying for us. <laughs> my brother, he's not going to me. He'll be in the kingdom. It's not my concern when. It's my concern to love him. Treat him well. and <laughs> Make a good fertile ground for him <laughs> to come in. But if it takes his death, then I'll take it there. Mm -hmm. I had my... my uh, wife had, you know, I've told you the story of a great uncle, 102, accepted the Lord, died that afternoon. You know, God is faithful. <laughs> he is faithful. So just hang in there. Even if you don't see it yourself, you can trust Him to take care of it. I believe that. Now that doesn't mean everybody gets there in the end. That's not a universalism just because, you know, <laughs> Because Jesus spends an awful lot of time talking about people gnashing teeth and being thrown out in the fire to, to believe that that doesn't exist. <laughs> it is. It does. But for those of us who are of the household of faith, who pray for our family members consistently, I face it with my own children now. I have to pray for them all the time. Lord, don't let them get away. <laughs> I know their tendency is to go away from you. And you're in a culture today that says they don't need the church. And you're in a culture that doesn't even think it needs God very much. And, you know, Lord, you can break through all of that. Mm -hmm. You got through my thick skull, so I know you can get through theirs. Mm -hmm. You know, just keep praying for them. Get on the knees, pray, 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 pray. And then get up and go out with a smile and serve the Lord. Love them to death. And treat them well. <laughs> you, know, you don't have to scream and yell at them. You don't have to preach at them. They know the truth. If they grew up in, your, in our home, they know the truth. There's nothing more I can tell them about Jesus. They just got to respond now, and that's up to the Holy Spirit and their hearts. Draw.